So this is the second video. Hopefully this one records. Um, the first video that you saw was um, one where I had some basics about recoding and I also had the unfortunate like spam and grocery delivery calls at the end of it. But the key one for that one is to figure out like some of the basics about how you recode, what levels of measurement mean for recoding. And we did the most simplest recode that you're going to be doing, which is for um, uh, education. That's like the basic easy one. We have missing data. We have clear categories. They have, are substantively important, all these other sorts of things. Uh, now I want to show you two that are going to be uh, a little bit more challenging in terms of the choices that we make. The actual mechanics of it are all right. Um, what I'm going to show you is what my do file looks like uh, because I did a whole video on this already and then my computer decided not to record it. So remember how at the end um, of the first video I said this is my do files look like this when I've got these blocks in them uh, where uh, yeah I've got like clean sorts of things where I make decisions about this. Uh, this is what this looks like uh, but that one didn't record so we'll do it again. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to go up into a new do file and I'm just going to go to this guy and I'm going to say, copy this over and I'm going to keep my education one just because I know that's what I did. Now I'm going to save this so you can see what it looks like for a do file to save. Um, this is going to be video two, take two. Thanks QuickTime. Hopefully you actually do your job this time. Sorry to sound grumpy, but it's like really grumpy when technology fails. Oh, there's the spinning wheel of death. Why do I have a spinning wheel of death? Because state is not responding. Okay. Well, I'll force quit that and we'll try again. All right. Let's open up my recent do file again. Oh, take two. It did save. I don't know why it's like this. Okay. Anyway, uh, struggles with technology, a perennial sort of thing when you're doing this kind of work. Uh, it happens to all of us, so don't feel bad if you're sitting and working with <laughs> these programs and are just like, why is it not working? Sometimes they just choose not to. So uh, here we are. If you've got your lesson plan um, from D2L that's uh, up there, there's your tutorial lesson three. You'll notice that we've got, like, we're using the full CES, we're looking at recode and missing data. We're learning how to build a do, do file and we've already done education in the first video. This video we're going to look at interest and ideology. So this particular document gives you more information about like what you need to do for these to answer the questions correctly on D2L. I'm going to show you a little bit more of a detailed background though, about what goes on into it. Um, okay, so I'm going to do political interest first and I need to find the variable for political interest. And so if I do look for interest, oh, I don't have my data set open. Boop, let me do that. There, that's a problem with the do file. It hid the part that I didn't have the data set open. So I open up the data set and then I'm gonna do look for interest. So here you can see a bunch of things. I know, oh boy, there's lots in here. Okay, so looking for a keyword sometimes pulls up a lot of stuff. Uh, I know this is probably the variable that I want. How interested are you in politics generally? And it's from the campaign period survey, which is what I would like. There's a post-election survey version of this too, but it's going to have fewer people in it. And I want to maximize the number of people I have. Here I've got interest during the in the election. Uh, this is from the campaign period as well. And then you can see like interest comes up as a keyword for like... Um, how people like this is trust in media or how they feel about the media in terms of like who's controlling it, women's interests, uh, politicians who they care about. And then we've got a whole host of questions about we're interested in how you see yourself. And you can see from these that these are the big five. So this is personality traits. That's what this stuff is about. Um, just so you're getting a tour of the CES. Now, one of the things that's frustrating here is that you can see I've got like a garbled name for uh, that political interest variable. I want that first one. I want the campaign period survey 19 interest, whatever it is. Um, 
And it runs, but I still want to know what the actual name of that variable is, like without the gobbledygook in it. So I find that by typing in my keyword here. And so here I know it's this first one, how interested are you in politics generally? And it's my CPS 19 interest gen one. So now that I've got the like unadulterated version of the variable name, I'm going to take that over to my do file. Okay. So I'm just using look for interest as my example. I'm going to get rid of that. So tab that. Uh, okay. There we are. Uh, there's my variable there. The background noise is my partner making lunch because I'm in the kitchen and he's rattling plastic. Okay, so here we've got how interested are you in politics generally, set the slider number from zero and it gets truncated off. So just because we wanna verify what this stuff is, you're gonna to wanna to find the interest variable exact matches and like this will pull up a whole bunch of things so uh, I'm gonna do interested are you and we'll see what comes up oh so this is the PES um, and so I want the next one which gets me to the CPS 19 interest gen how interested are you in politics generally set the slider to a number from 0 to 10 where 0 means no interest at all and 10 mil means a great deal of interest okay so we talked last week how this is either a ratio variable because zero means no interest. So we have a true zero point. Uh, so if we assume that these intervals are all even, this is a ratio level variable. Um, if we don't, it's an ordinal variable. So this is one of these variables where we cannot eliminate any categories. We have to keep all of them in, even though we want to work them into a more usable format. Now, if we were running super advanced stats, I would probably just keep this as it is. But this is not a class for super advanced stats. This is a class for more simple stats. And so what we need to do is get this into a format that's more usable into a table. So I want to recode this into low, moderate, and high categories. I do that by finding the 33% cut point and the 66% cut point. The reason why I do this is that I want to divide this variable into something called relative thirds. The argument for this is as follows. I don't actually think that the number people are choosing for this particular variable matters a lot. I think uh, people, when they choose a particular number, I don't think that... Uh, the number itself, like I don't think a four means something in particular here, other than like it's towards the lower end of the scale. And I don't think seven means a lot, except that it's like above quite a lot of the scale, but like not all of it. Um, what I think really matters for this is where people are relative to other folks. Like this is one of these things where somebody could say, oh, this is my level of interest. But if most other people are more interested in them, then what matters isn't the number that they chose, but their position relative to other people. Um, there's any number of variables that we use that are like this, where um, the actual number, I'm kind of agnostic as to the actual number. What I'm interested in is where people are compared to other folks. Uh, and so this is this idea of relative thirds. So how do we find these relative thirds? Here you can see in the variable, we've got this table. This is frequency distribution of the variable that we're interested in. Uh, and what it is, is it's showing us some information here. So we've got the actual values of the variable, the zero to 10 and everything in between. Frequency, this is what that means. And it just means the number of people in each category. So it's just a count of the people who are in each category. Percent. This is sometimes called relative frequency, so it's just the percent of the cases that are in each. Uh, and you can totally see that it's like small, 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 and then we start to get a lot bigger. And so what this is telling me is that I might actually be onto something when I say relative thirds matters because we don't start actually getting people, like they start to clump towards the top end of the scale, right? Like this is where we start to see most people clumping. We've got like smaller numbers, and then we've got like, again, smaller numbers, but like we've got clumps there. And then here we've got the cumulative percent. And so this is what I'm gonna wanna do to find where my cut points are, that cl as close to 33 as I can swing and as close to 66 as I can swing. And you can see here that this is not 
super even. Like sometimes uh, the raw data just shows up and you see these like nice even splits and it makes it super easy to figure out where the cut points are. But for this, you can see because they're clumped kind of towards like this, especially like they're clumping in seven and eight, um, it's making it a little bit like less neat. And so if I'm trying to find my first point, which is like ballpark where 33 is, I have two choices. I can either do this one where I can see just over 28% of people fall here, or I can do this one, which is almost 41. And so the choice I would make is what's closest to 33 on the understanding that I've just made this category smaller potentially than what it could be. But like 28 is a lot closer to 33 than 41 is. And so this is going to be my first category. This is my low group. And so here I just see that it's five and below. So that's my low category. Uh, so what I'm going to do is gen interest equals that variable. Then I'm going to recode interest uh, zero through five equals one. And remember how it's zero, the forward slash through five gets me to collapse that whole category into one. Now I have to decide my next category. Um, so where's my 66? I could do 61 and just be a little bit below it, or I could do 80 and be well over it. And so I think I'm going to choose 61 there, which means that if I've done zero through five for my first category, that means my middle is going to be six through seven. Okay. So six through seven equals two for the middle. And that leaves eight through 10, um, for my third. Now, what about missing data? Do I have missing data here? And the answer is probably, there's probably some people who didn't answer this question, but they're not showing up in this distribution here. Like I don't have a don't know. I don't have a refused. I know zero and 10 substantively means something for this question. And so anybody who's missing just like didn't answer it, which means that they're already missing. And so I don't have to worry about them. Um, if I had like a don't know, then I would have to do something with it, but I can see here that I don't have it. So that's fine. So I'll do recode interest and then tab one. I'm gonna do the original variable and interest. Okay. So I can select all of those and run them all at the same time. And I get my first variable, then I've got interest. And I've got these one, two, three. Now I wanna check a couple of things here. I've got the total number of cases. They're the same. I haven't inadvertently lost anyone. They're all there. Um, and I can also look at the cut points that I've got here, right? Like, so I know my first category ends at five, the accumulated percentage matches. I know my second category ends at seven and that matches. So I can be confident that I haven't made an error and like left anybody out who I shouldn't have left out. So for me to finish this, uh, then what I have to do is define value labels. So I'll do label define interest, one low interest, two moderate. I did not spell that right. Moderate interest, three high interest. Label values, interest, interest, tab interest. Oops. Okay. And so there, now you can see this is much neater. It's you can tell right from the table, like this is like bottom third, middle third, high third, or pretty close to that. And here you can see that we knew that we were making that first category smaller. Uh, but by definition, either this was going to be the monster category, or this is going to be like a little bit smaller. So this is pretty close to even thirds. And I would say that this is probably the best approach for a variable like this. If you want to be able to put it into the kinds of analysis that you'll be doing, and you know, this is an instance where relative thirds matters quite a lot, then, uh, yeah, this is, I think the best approach to go. And this is the one that you should use for D2L. But one of the things I want to show you is like an alternative coding where you're like, okay, but I feel as though I don't believe for you know reasons related to my own cynicism that um, the biggest, like the plurality of Canadians are actually like best characterized as high interest. Even though this is what they told me in the Canadian election study, I don't believe the data. Now, this is not a very empirical approach. Like um, you might want to resist this temptation, but 
say you wanted to make the argument that the only reason that somebody could be categorized as high interest is if they actually were prepared to take the plunge and pick one of those like, uh, like maximal categories, like nine or 10. Like even though we've had discussions in class before about how some people just shy away from that just because they don't want to, not because of anything substantive about the question, but just because they don't want to go that far out. Um, which is the main reason why you shouldn't take this approach, but let's say for argument that you are, uh, what would happen if you wanted to revise this high category? So it's just nine and 10 instead of like eight and nine, like we had here, you've got a couple of choices then. Um, what you could do is you could just leave the moderate as seven. So that would mean that it's just like you have a category that's like only like one in five. So it's the plurality standalone category. It's kind of little, like you could either like just leave seven on its, well, you, what you'd have to do is you'd either have to, you'd have to like chuck in the eights with the sevens. Um, so either you could make a, you could keep the bottom category the same, or you could say, you know what, I'm going to go all the way up to 40. I think that it is best for me to say that most Canadians are not interested in politics. And so I'm going to say that 41% of Canadians actually have low interest. So if you were to do it this way, um, let me do gen interest alt for alternative equals. Is that, there we are. Okay, so I'm going to recode it to be like, you know, I want that big category to be uh, like, yeah. Say you actually want to like cook this so that you can make people seem apathetic. And then I'm going to take my seven and eights to be my moderate. And then the only people who really count as interested are like my extreme nines and tens. Uh, what does this look like here? What you've got are like a monster category, a monster category, and a smaller category. This is what I would say is like a normatively motivated coding scheme where like it would be somebody to make this argument that like you'd have to only, you'd only be able to be defined as high interest if you took an extreme or like a polar view on a particular question, like sometimes this is justifiable, um, but in a context where you actually want to make relative thirds, where you're looking for low, moderate, and high, like you really want them to be as even as possible, right? So if a student was writing this and saying, you know, I actually think that in order for somebody to be count as like interested in politics or high interest, they have to take an extreme view. My question would be like, well, isn't eight close enough? Like that's pretty high. Um, but then it would also be like, why, like, I, I would just be really skeptical of any kind of approach like that. And I would think that what's motivating is more than just like the empirical consideration. So for me, I always find this like idea that for something like this, what matters is where people are relative to each other. I'm agnostic as to the number that they take. And so to make this alternative one where you've got the smaller top category, to make that work, you'd actually have to like, come up with some rationale for why the numbers actually mattered uh, in a way that I think is actually just way too difficult to do uh, and like way too difficult to do persuasively um, in the context of this particular variable. So I would, I would recommend trying to just find as even thirds as possible. So there you're looking for your 33 and your 66 is your cut point. I'm going to get rid of the alternative coding because I don't think that works particularly well. Okay. And like I said, this like, one here where it's the zero to five, the six and seven, and the eight and 10. This is the one that is used for your D2L. So that's what I would use for that one. Uh, at least to make sure that you get those answers on D2L correct for the quiz. But yeah, when it comes to your own research report, you can make all the choices that you want. You just have to make sure that you can justify them um, to me, who will be grading them or the TAs. Okay. Uh, let's also look at ideology. Ideology is different. Like ideology is measured on that same zero to 10 scale. Uh, but the meaning of the zero and the 10, uh, and the five are, are very different. So remember, this is one of these ones where like zero is left, 10 is right. Um, that means by definition, five is the absolute middle. Like it's, it's not a ratio variable. The ideology variables on that zero to 10 scale, it, like they are at best interval. Um, so there's still this hierarchy, um, you, you might not see the gaps across the categories to be equal, in which case you would treat it as ordinal. But the point is you still have a category, you still have a hierarchy, which means that you can't chuck anybody out. Um, you have to keep all the data together. So, but like it means something different. We're dealing like not with relative thirds. We're dealing with like uh, 
labels that actually mean something. So what does this look like for ideology? Um, we could do the same strategy of like, look for ideology. And that comes up without anything. So, but if you do look for, I'm going to do left, right. Um, cause I know that's what the question wording is. So here I've got a couple of options and here I've got in politics, people sometimes talk of left and right. Where would you place? And part of me is going to be like, where would you place yourself? Where zero is left and 10 is right. I've got this other one again with gobbledygook where it looks like it's the exact same thing, which is a bit weird. Uh, then I've got like words where like equal rights has pushed into this. This is a classic question in the Canadian election study, asking people to agree or disagree if we've gone too far in pushing equal rights in this country. Uh, empirically, the answer to this is no, but people will take different attitudinal views on that. Um, and then we've got another one, the self right, um, left, right placement here, which looks very similar to this, but it's from the post election study. And then we've got another right space question there. Okay. So this is where I'm going to go over to the code book. Uh, and here I'm going to look for left and right. And that should get these variables for me here. So I know, ah, interesting. So here it says CPS left right scale BEF, which could stand for before. And so if I'm looking at the questionnaire here, these are the questions presented in order. So I've got this like left, right one. There it is. People are moving the slider. Um, and I think maybe they could click the don't know, prefer not to answer there. It's in French. Then we have a series of questions where in politics, people sometimes talk of left and right. Looks pretty similar. Where would you place the federal political parties on a scale? So this is actually asking people to rate the parties. And then we have after. So in politics, people sometimes talk of left and right. Where would you place yourself on this scale? So I just want to make sure I'm going to do left here and this will show up this one. So I'll just do tab one. And this is my before and after here from the campaign period survey. Whoopsies. Um, there. What's interesting about this is that I can already tell, like, just look at the number of cases for my interest variable. I've got 35,000 people here. Uh, my before has 14 and my after has. So I'm like just shy of 15 in each of these. What this tells me is that half the sample got asked that left, right question during the campaign period survey before that question about political parties and half the sample got asked about it after. Now, what I think the people who wrote the Canadian election study are doing here is they want to see um, if the like self-reflective, self-referential, where do I think I sit on an ideological scale? They want to see if this is going to be moved by how people view political parties. And so what this is getting at is like the after statement is likely going to be what we call contaminated by the questions that came before it. So it could be contaminated by people who identify with one of the parties. And so they'll say, well, I think this party is this number on the left, right scale. So that means I should be that number two because I identify with that party. It doesn't matter which party it is. Um, then they're letting their partisanship affect the ideological self-placement that they give themselves. Um, or it could be, I really hate that party. <laughs> and I think that party is this number, which means that I want to be as far away from them as possible. So I'm going to choose that number. Um, so you could be getting other considerations other than like the image somebody has in their head of themselves. And for something like ideology, this is where I actually think that you really want to go with the, the image that someone has of themselves in their own mind for this one. And so this is why I think if I was using the ideology question, I would either pick the before from the campaign period survey, or I would choose the one from the post-election survey. Now the post-election survey one, um, far fewer people answer the post-election survey, like 4,000 folks is still a lot. Uh, so I'm not worried about the number of cases, but like 4,000 isn't 15,000. And it depends on like the kind of disaggregation I want to do. Right. And so I, I lose a number of cases here. Um, but I would either choose like the post-election survey one or the uh, campaign period survey before. And I think like, let's go with the post. Well, no, I did the D2L one with the before one. So we'll do the before question. That's the one that I would do. So why do we want to go with like the images that people have in their own mind about this? Um, when we're talking about something like ideology, 
What we're really getting at is like the subjective self placement, a subjective self evaluation. Now, political interest is one of these things too. Um, but ideology is much more loaded. And I think the, the, the labels mean a lot more, I think, than what you would see in that interest question, even though they're all zero to tens and things along those lines. But identifying on the left versus the right, um, and like how far on the left and how far on the right, uh, identifying with the actual like true middle. Um, so like literally not taking a step to the left or the right, like these are very conscious choices and they tell us something really interesting. And I think important about how somebody sees themselves as a political actor, where they see themselves in political space. This is very different from the parties that they identify with. Um, I mean, all my American colleagues will say, just because somebody says they're a Democrat doesn't mean they identify as a liberal. And if we're asking about ideology in the States, it's like liberal versus conservative. And in Canada, we don't because party labels confuse things. Um, but people can identify as like a partisan of a particular party, um, but then still taking an, a different position on the left-right scale. Uh, so in, historically in the past, it would be um, common for people who identified with the liberals to still identify as pretty conservative. Um, and that might be motivated by, you know, economic issues or something along those lines. Um, if you think about the red Tory in Canadian politics, this would be somebody who would identify on some issues as pretty, like, socially progressive, sometimes out on the left, but still also be like, feel some ways about other issues. And so this is also why I want to make the pitch for using the subjective self-evaluation as an indicator rather than like a researcher's own assessment. Uh, because when I ask about this in class, when we're face to face, what people will say is they're like, well, the best measure of somebody's ideology is the measure that I give them as a researcher. So as the researcher, I'm going to say whether or not they're like left or right or moderate or whatever. And I'm going to use a bunch of policy positions and I'll say things. Well, like, well, what if people are kind of agnostic as to policy and they don't care about a particular issue? Um, like what does that do to like you labeling them as something? And they're like, well, like I, that just shows that I'm right. Like I have to label them because they don't know themselves well enough. And I'm the one who knows. So I have to give them the label. And it's like, okay. Um, like there's an arrogance that's associated with that, that I think, um, might not necessarily be immediately apparent, but it is literally as a researcher saying to like a participant, I know you better than you know yourself. <laughs> and, I, I mean, as a researcher, I would really avoid saying that, like for ethical reasons, but also for like substantive empirical reasons. I don't think I would have evidence to be able to say that. But um, even if I had really carefully crafted messages or policies that I was using for these things. Um, but the other thing I would say is if we're interested in trying to figure out why somebody is motivated to like do things then what would matter more, like a label that we can put on them as researchers or the images and the ideas and the identifications that are going on in their own head? And at the end of the day, if I want to explain why people are behaving the way that they are, uh, it's the images in their own head that I think actually drives a lot of what's happening. And so it's that image in their head that I want to use as a potential causal factor. Uh, because I would imagine that most people would be either agnostic or sometimes hostile or disagree with the labels that we as researchers put on them, right? And so I want the idea of like this subjective self-referential identification that people are using, which is why I think this is the best measure of ideology that we've got. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna generate a variable for ideology that equals this one from before they have to do the party thing because I don't want the one that's contaminated with how they think about parties and other stuff and get other forms of identity going on. I just kind of want their like the cleanest view of this, the first one that they think of. Okay, now for this one, unlike interest, I'm not going to go with relative thirds. I think what matters is whether or not people choose to identify on the left, in the middle, or on the right. And for me, I actually think taking a step to the left is substantively important. So anything that's below a five, like the five is the true midpoint, the true middle. So I'm gonna say anything below a five counts as my left. Five is my middle and just like any step below the middle um, or to the left of the middle uh, counts as taking, like identifying the left, so too would identifying with anything on the right. So I would say like a six is probably like much more of a moderate right than the 10, but the point is that it's on the right. 
Um, same thing with the four. The four is a more moderate left than the zero, but it's still on the left. Again, you'll note, I don't have any missing data. I don't have don't knows or confused. I have people who didn't answer this question, uh, obviously, because they didn't get it. So I've got a bunch of missing data, but it's not data missing data that I have to worry about dealing with with a recode. Okay, so I'm going to do tab. Oop, it's not interest. That's ideology. I made a mistake there, but I caught it before I ran it. Okay, so generate ideology that way. Okay, so there's the distribution. And like you can see, I've got like over a third, like my left and my right are my bigger categories and my middle is kind of hollowed out. So an alternative that I could do, uh, ideology alternative would be, oopsies, not that, but like the same raw variable. And say you're doing like, uh, alt, oopsies, typos everywhere. Um, instead of doing like anything to the left counts as left, I'm going to be like, well, I need to be at least like one point away from the middle. And I'm going to say like one step to the left and one step to the right around that midpoint counts as actually middle. Uh, and then I'm going to make it like that way. So it, like people actually have to take, be further away from the middle to count as uh, being on the left or the right. Uh, tab. That's what I'm going to go with. What does that end up looking like? Okay. Of course, because I've got a typo. Here, you can just copy and paste your typo, and then there it is. Uh, what this ends up doing is that you end up with this giant middle category. Uh, so, I mean, like, it's not that much bigger than that one, but still like the middle gets stacked and then the, the left and the right get, um, they're smaller. And so the distribution like is like, it's okay on both of them. I don't love the distribution on either of these, but I don't actually think for this particular variable, the distribution should be my deciding value. Um, what I think needs to be my deciding factor here is what makes the most sense in terms of a measurement. And so for me, um, I struggle to justify uh, this particular coding where everything that's kind of around the middle counts as the middle, because I think what it's important and I think it means something uh, if people are choosing to pick a side, left or right on this versus deliberately choosing just to pick the exact middle. Now, what's interesting is I've been doing this for a number of years, and it used to be that this middle category in Canada was actually, like, by far the biggest. So we actually had to keep the middle category on its own because, like, half the cases were in it. Uh, and we're like, oh, Canadians, we're sure, like, moderate. And we really don't like picking a side at all. Oh, goodness. Uh, and, I mean, you can see this is political polarization, um, often, I think, coming up from the United States, affecting Canadian politics. And in 2019, you can see, like, in 2004 this was not the case. Uh, that's only 15 years ago, right? So we've seen some pretty big shifts on this one. So like back in the day, it, it would be a super easy decision based on um, distribution too. But I mean, for me, I think choosing like the left, even if it's like a little bit off the middle or choosing the right, even if it's a little bit off the middle, I think that that matters. And so I would go with this first one where everybody on the left counts as the left then you've got the middle, and then everybody on the right counts as the right. So in order for me to fix, finish this, I have to define my label. So label define ideology, one is left, two is literally middle, oops, finish my quotes, and three is right. Label values, ideology, ideology, tab, ideology. Okay, cool. And if I do this tab, one, the raw, oopsies, the raw variable and my new one. Then I can see I've not lost anyone. I've got the same number of cases. I can look at my relative percents. Like I know four is that first category there. And so that make, I, everything matches. I've not dropped anyone. This is good. Okay, uh, a couple of things I want to emphasize before I wrap this video up, this whole process of like idea of there's an alternative way of doing this. Um, this is the way that I want you to do it. What you, what I've like 
made the decision rule on this is what you need to do to like get the correct answers on d2l so like if for nothing else like just do it that way to get your correct answers on d2l but the exercise is i think more important what i'm trying to communicate with the exercise is that as researchers we have choices and we always have to defend those choices so for your research report when you're actually doing the analysis stage which is the second part uh, you will have to justify why you've made these choices the way that you have. Um, and you'll have to have persuasive reasons for it. And you'll get grades, like more or less of them, um, depending on how good your rationale is. And so for me, what I've presented is what I think is the most compelling rationale for both of these. This is the idea that interest is one of these variables. It's zero to 10. And I don't think the number actually matters as much as where people are relative to each other for that particular concept. Um, but for ideology, I think it's different. I think the number actually really does matter. And that choice means something um, significant and substantive for that particular concept. So, I mean, the numbers are the same for both of them, but the rationale for the codes is very different. And so you have to have a justification for that. Now, if I've not persuaded some of you that these are like the best codes to use, that's totally fine. Like you can make different choices as a researcher. The point is that the choices that you make, you must justify and you must defend. Uh, like, and it's mandatory, you get grades for it on the research report. But like also in general, this is another way to critique other people's work where if you're reading that boring data and methods section for a journal and you're like, wow, I wouldn't have chosen that measure. I think that's a terrible choice. And I don't think they justified it well enough. Then like, yeah, you can totally critique a piece based on that. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is um, something like it's the pitch for why you always want to create new variables. So here you can see I've got the interest variable that I chose and the ideology one. And then I've got these two alternatives that I'm not going to use. And these are just variables that I created. I'm just going to do drop both of them and they go away. Uh, this is my big pitch for why you should always create new variables while you're recoding them. Because if you make a mistake or if you decide you don't like your codes or whatever, you just kick out that new variable and you still have all of the original data in its pure form or it's an original form um, for you to keep working with. Uh, and you've not like changed any of this. Like it is like it exists as it is uh, and you can continue to work with it as you see fit. Um, this is why you always want to create new variables, right? Uh, yeah, left and middle and right. Okay, so I'm just completing my notes in here for that part. Okay, so that's the like second bit of recoding. Uh, I've already saved my do file, so I'm going to close that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you quit Stata. And Stata always gives you this thing like data in memory have changed, and this is key. I know my do file, I know my codes are safe because I've just saved them, but it's saying data and memory have changed. Do you want to save these before quitting? And I always say don't save because I know I can always get my work back from the do file. So that do file becomes really important, um, but I also want to like preserve the original data. And so I'm not going to save this. I'm just going to keep the raw election study as it is. And I'm just going to rely on my do file to be able to get those recodes back. Okay, so I'm going to say don't save. And then Stata is wrapped up. I just didn't end my log, sorry, but I mean, I'm pretty sure once I quit Stata, I might have ended anyway. All right, um, the third video is the one where we show the really gnarly recode. It's complicated, but it's one that you need to know, especially if you want to use income as a variable at all. Like it's mandatory to do the recode that shows up in the third video, which is why we present it to you early so that you can practice it um, in case you want to use that for your research report. So stay tuned for that.